I'm Scott Allen Miller. This is my vlog of daily life living as an expat in Latin America. I relocated from the United States to Nicaragua a number of years ago, and a lot of you have questions, and this makes a lot of sense, about why things work a certain way, both here in Nicaragua, when you're just relocating from country to country, becoming an expat or an immigrant can be a really unique experience, and there's a lot of things that you're not going to have access to information about very well. So we're going to be answering a few questions today. Specifically today, we're going to be tackling why Nicaragua doesn't allow you to just buy a car when you move here, and someone had questions about how you take out Cordoba, or how much Cordoba you can take out from an ATM. So we're going to get to those things right after the bump. For most of us, relocating to a new country and becoming an expat is a one-time life experience. It is pretty rare that you're going to become an expat and then decide to become an expat again. Of course you can, and some people do, and some people move all over the world, and I am actually on my eighth country, depending on how you look at it. Technically, Nicaragua was my fourth, but I went to four more before I came back and decided that this was the right place for me. I definitely put in a lot of research, more than most people living in, in many different parts of the world and doing lots and lots of visiting. I've been to about 40 countries, lived in eight, and uh, really did my homework before moving to Nicaragua. That's itself pretty rare. You should definitely do your homework, but you don't necessarily need to live all over the world. But when it comes to actually the act of relocating, especially to a new country rather than to just a new state or city, there's often a lot of things that we will never encounter at other points in our lives. And so this brings in entire areas of knowledge that we just maybe have never thought about or have no uh, normal access to information or discussions about. So we're hit with a bunch of new things. We're going to talk about why Nicaragua doesn't allow you or if they don't allow you to buy a car when you move here because that is something that a lot of people ask or wonder like why do they do this but it's I think it's it's simpler than you think it's just something that nobody thinks about and really puts into any kind of perspective because why would they but before we get to that I had the question just asked this morning of how many Cordobas can you take out of the ATM uh, here in Nicaragua. Cordobas are the local Nicaraguan currency because we're dual currency here in Nicaragua so you're able to take out US dollars or Nicaraguan Cordoba from basically any ATM. In fact, I have yet to encounter one that doesn't offer both. So the question was brought up because the person said when they've been here in the past, they've done this, they found that the limits on Cordoba were quite low and so they ended up taking out US dollars instead. Now, some real quick background, we've talked about this before, the US dollar is currently at $1 to 37 Cordoba. So if you were gonna take out $100, that would be uh, 3,700 Cordoba, right? It takes a little bit to get that math into your head, but it's really not hard. It's just a matter of multiplying or dividing by 37, and that's, that's about it. So the six Cordoba city bus ride is 16 cents US, right? You get, you get used to it after not too long, but it can be a little bit much if you're new. So once you get that math in your head, it'll be easy. So if you go to an ATM, they're finding that they're able to take out more US dollars. Now, I'll be honest, for our experience here in Leon, it is absolutely the opposite. It is very rare that we can, not so normally we can take out equal amounts, uh, but sometimes more often we can take out fewer dollars than we can take out uh, Cordoba or less value in dollars than we can take out Cordoba. The way that all the banks that I know work, all the ATMs that we have here in the country work, and I've experienced the majority of them, is that it is equal amounts. They actually put their limit in one currency or the other and then just give you an equal limit in the other one. Now, that being said, Cordoba comes in very small denominations. Uh, many ATMs will dispense potentially even as small as a 10 or 20 Cordoba note. That's pretty small. If you're dealing with US dollars, nothing dispenses smaller than a $20 bill here in the country. Getting anything uh, smaller than that is very hard, uh, and getting anything below a dollar is unheard of. People do not know US change here in the country. We do not work with coinage. It is only the physical dollars. So that one US dollar equals 17 Cordoba. And most things will only dispense $20, which is uh, 720 Cordoba. So when you're dealing with these kinds of numbers, there is a possibility that you will get more or less value by taking dollars or Cordoba out simply because of, let's say they set the limit at $100 US and the nearest denomination you're allowed to take out in Cordoba is 3,500, then technically you'd get more US dollars. But if they set the limit at 4,000 Cordobas, then likely you'd be able to take out more Cordobas than dollars, but just by small amounts, it's just by the conversion number and it could go either direction. 
So that's one possibility. Uh, the other thing that happens a lot is that uh, the ATMs will run out of one or the other. If you're dealing with uh, times and areas with a lot of expats and people are doing a lot of tourist activities or a lot of big business activities, you're going to notice that dollars get hit in the ATMs really hard. At other times, you may be there for a Friday payday when the, the locals are getting paid and they're lining up and they're emptying the ATMs of Cordobas, and then the Cordobas may disappear and the dollars may be in plentiful supply. So that can happen. But under normal circumstances, when the ATMs are fully stocked, in all but the oddest of circumstances, it is going to be essentially equal amounts that you can withdraw in any given withdrawal of of either one, basically. Now, if you're seeing a difference where you're being allowed to take out more of one than the other based on an allowance, and it really isn't, you know, the ATM is fully stocked with both, um, then almost certainly that limit is coming from your bank and not from the banks here. It doesn't, I don't, maybe there's a bank here that has some limit like that, but I'm not aware of any. And there's no national limit that is being enforced. The ATMs are working off of their individual bank limits. So some of the banks uh, in U.S. dollars limit at 400. Some of them limit at 500. And I know some limit at 800. There could be ones that are higher. There could be ones that are lower. Those are the numbers we see every day with BAC. Last I looked, right, they, they do change. BAC was at 400. Lafise was at 500. And Banpro was at 800, all with the same fee. So the larger you're able to take out with an identical fee, obviously the better the deal. So Band Pro's uh, percentage that they take off the top is literally half that the BAC does and almost half what Lafise does. So you try to use Band Pro for us here, especially because Band Pro is our local bank uh, and the others we have to go into the city. So we favor Band Pro for our ATM usage quite heavily, but we bank with Lafise because they make it much easier for expats and expat businesses. So you're, what you need will be different based on what you do in the country, but for almost all cases, your limits are the same. So it could easily be that either you're just running into situations where they're running out of Cordoba. That definitely happens. Cash supply in the country is not always as fluid as you would hope. Um, and that happens in the U.S. too, but, but definitely the U.S. has that kind of stuff much more under control. Uh, but it is most likely that your bank wherever you're coming from is giving you different limits per day based on maybe their under the hood transactions, their accessibility to the currency or something like that, because they have to do some trading in the back end as well. It's not necessarily super straightforward, or they may have some kind of transfer limits based on their network of things. There's a lot of factors that can happen at your bank. So that we can only hypothesize about, but here in country for all normal purposes, same amount from each. All right, so why? Why does Nicaragua not allow you to buy a car when you move to Nicaragua? Well, first of all, let's, let's be clear, they do. You absolutely can buy a car when you live here. Uh, but let, let's put some framework around this. And similarly, we had a talk just that prompted this probably uh, recently about how you import, you know, uh, household goods or whatever into the country um, and you got to pay your customs and all these things. And some people responded with, are you serious? I'm not allowed to import things. And we're like, we literally just described that you are allowed to import things. You just have to pay the same fees as everyone else. You're not getting a free pass. You're not getting free import. No one else does either. That's not not allowed. That's absolutely allowed. That's like saying, well, I went to a restaurant and they charged me sales tax. Am I not allowed to eat here? Of course you are. There's just taxes. That's that's just how it works. Welcome to life. So importing a car, what are you allowed to do? So th there's both importing a car. Sorry, that's not really what we're talking about. Buying a car. That was the question. Why can't you buy a car? So one of the things that's unique about Nicaragua, this throws a lot of people off because when we're talking about other countries, most countries, most countries, and we're, we're talking about moving there, you're immediately talking about residency requirements. Here in Nicaragua, we're incredibly unique. I know of no other country, there are others, but I don't really know of any who use the basically automatic, most people can just come and stay. That's Americans, Canadians, uh, Brits, Europeans, huge Mexicans, I believe, huge swaths of the world can move to Nicaragua with no particular paperwork and just stay. And then, yeah, you have to do a border run, but you can basically live here and you get all these rights and capability and power. You can buy houses and real estate and businesses and do all these things with just being a tourist. And you can do them even if you're not a tourist. You can do them if you're abroad. Like, like I've said this before, if you watching the show get an inkling that, you know what, I want to buy a house in Nicaragua and I don't want to visit. One, I'm going to say you're an idiot. Don't do that. But two, if you decide to do it anyway, no one's going to stop you. Nicaragua's going to be like, absolutely. 
have fun. Here's your house, right? They don't care that you're here or you're here and you're a tourist or you're here and a resident or you're here and a citizen. All those cases can buy a house or start or buy a business. So you have this incredible flexibility that very few countries have. The U.S. has a few of these, right? The U.S. has, if you want to buy a business in the U.S., they're going to be like, yes, so fluid, so easy. You want to buy a house in the U.S., nearly as fluid, nearly as easy, like really, really easy. It's one of the things that makes the U.S. really popular for these things because they don't have these extra barriers to, to basic business. And it's fantastic. And Nicaragua has replicated this uh, here, or maybe it was replicated the other way. I don't know who did it first. But the point being, they're very fluid in that way. But the U.S. makes it extremely cumbersome to move to the U.S., even just to be a tourist is generally, even if you're a European, and to some degree, even if you're a Canadian, there's all this work that goes into being allowed to tour the U.S. They'll generally let you, but there's all this work that goes into it and sometimes fees. And then if you do that, yeah, your limits are serious. Like you get this many days and you got to be gone. There's no border runs. There's no just coming right back in. It's it, Sometimes you have to reapply. Like it, it's pretty cumbersome. But Nicaragua doesn't have that. It has just show up. You don't need a visa or your visa is automatic is, is how it's referred. And you can stay not for 90, but for 180 days. Yes, you have to extend, but it's super easy and everybody gets it. And you can do border runs. So the ability to stay and do all these things is really unique to Nicaragua. And when you do that, it creates a situation where we as humans are in a scenario that we never think about in any other situation. And that is a de facto resident under a tourist visa. So we are tourists essentially forever. It doesn't really last forever. At some point, they're going to make you become a, a full-blown resident with residencia and the paperwork. And, and at that point, things change. And we'll talk about that. But, but you have this situation where you, you indefinitely are in a repetitious pattern of being a tourist, but in all other aspects of life, business, homes, property, investments, living, staying, all these things, you're able to act like you would be a resident in other countries. So we call it a de facto resident. And yes, under the tax law, you are also a resident automatically. So I had to answer this on a legal form just recently. Are you a resident of Nicaragua? Yeah, absolutely. I have been for years. But what we call a resident here is not what I am. I'm still under a tourist visa. I am an automatic resident under a tourist visa, which is a complicated scenario when you look at it from the outside. But it's completely normal in Nicaragua. No problem at all. So because of this, we have a situation where people picture themselves as being full residents and for most things you are, but then when they want to buy a car, it's awkward because basically no country in the world, there must be an exception, but I do not know who they are, allows you to buy a car that is not being shipped overseas. If you're exporting, that's different. Lots of places let you do that. But if you're buying a car without an immediate export, you can't do that as a tourist. That is, I don't know anywhere that lets you do that. And there's really good reasons why they don't. Cars are unique. They're a little bit like houses, except they're very mobile. So houses, a lot of places, U.S. and Nicaragua as examples, are happy to let you buy. Because if anything goes wrong, one, it's really hard to drive your house into someone and kill them. Yes, accidents can happen in your house. Maybe you'll be held liable, but it's, it's like a fringe thing. But when you're driving a car, there's so much opportunity for that car to be used as a weapon, in a crime, in an accident, you name it. So cars are special in that way. Houses are protected because if, if you don't pay your taxes, if you don't pay your bills, if you commit a crime, that house can get a lien against it. It can be whatever, right? The house is a physical thing that they can monitor, that they can guarantee for all intents and purposes. Yes, you may burn it down, but the, you're throwing your own stuff away too. But a car, potentially, you're just going to put it on a boat or you can drive it over the border and then that car is gone and that could pose a problem. So cars are very, very controlled compared to houses because they have the, the big high cost of a house in many cases, uh, but they have all this risk of accidents, all this risks of being used in a crime, all this risks of being stolen that houses really don't have. And so cars need to be controlled in very specific ways. And so there's both the capability to purchase a car and there's the capability of registering a car. And to register a car is what allows it to be used on the road and allows it to do things. And basically no country in the world will let you register a car as a tourist. They don't have enough information on you. They don't have enough control of you. They don't have the legal right to do things to you. You're just going to leave. And if you take that car, what are they going to do? Right? So here in Nicaragua, technically, you are totally allowed to buy a car under the tourist regime. That, that buy a house, buy a business, all those things. Can you buy a car? Yes, you can. Can you register a car? No, you can't. 
So you're allowed to physically own it, park it in your driveway, and stare at it all you want. But if you want to be able to put it on the road and potentially steal it, have an accident with it, whatever, you've got to go beyond the tourist system in order to do that. Somebody who is officially a part of Nicaragua needs to be the owner of that car. So, of course, what a lot of people will do is simply find a friend uh, that they trust or that they pay, whatever, and they'll put the car in their name and they can register it. The the expat may, I don't know anyone who does this, but may actually buy the car and then a Nicaraguan may register the car. That's a weird, I don't know if you can mix those, I have no idea, but they do this registration through the Nicaraguans. It's a huge risk, but people do it and people do it every day. Most people, it's not a problem. Personally, I wouldn't recommend it, but you can do that. But so the issue is not buying a car, it is registering a car and there shouldn't be an expectation that as a tourist, you can register a car. In no other country would it ever cross your mind to think that maybe you could do that, but... It's so unique in Nicaragua that you're a de facto resident, but you're still under a tourist visa, that it's easy to forget you're actually still a tourist technically, even though you've lived here potentially for years. You've made the decision to move here. You've moved in, you committed, you bought a house, you're investing, all these things. Oh, I must be able to buy a car, right? No, no, that's a completely different animal. You're a tourist, don't forget. It's just that Nicaragua gives you so much flexibility as a tourist, you forget you're a tourist. Literally, that's, that's actually what happens to people. Now, Remember, with all this, you are allowed to incorporate a business. And that business is allowed to buy a car. And you're allowed to drive. You can rent a car. You can drive a friend's car. You can own a business that owns a car. And you can drive it. Oh, that's fine. So you're not actually being barred from having a car. You're being barred from personally registering a car while you're a tourist and have not become a resident. That is it. And that is, that's a universal thing. I Literally, no country that I know of will let you do that. Maybe maybe some places that are islands because they just have different concerns. Like they're like, whatever, right? You can imagine some Caribbean islands being like, I don't care, what are you gonna do? Flee and leave the car behind? Great, we'll get a car, right? So whatever, but in general, and I don't know that any of them do that. I'm just saying that the attitude could be there because what, what, what difference would it make? So that's what, so there's definitely paths for you to have a car. There's so many ways that you can have a car as a tourist. But, so we wanna touch on this. The question then becomes, but I've heard that when you buy a car as a business, you're not allowed to drive it over the borders. Yes, that's absolutely true. And it may seem like, well, once again, Nicaragua's curtailing our freedoms. No, this has nothing to do with Nicaragua at all, right? So this is important, and this is true anywhere in the world, uh, but some places have, have business jurisdictions that go outside their national borders, like the EU, the Schengen, right? And the US and Canada are a special zone, and those things throw people off, because that's where you tend to witness uh, a lot of these transactions and you forget that this is driving between say Nicaragua and Costa Rica is not like driving between the US and Canada. It's not like driving between Germany and France. It's like driving between Spain and Morocco, which you can totally do, but it's a super hard border with full everything at border control. There's zero intermingling of jurisdictions. And so because of this, if a business owns a car and that business has registered the car, and it's fully legal in Nicaragua, and you drive to the Costa Rican border and you want to drive it across the border. If you were the personal owner of that car, they would check your passport and your visa and all that for Costa Rica. And yeah, there's probably some paperwork to move the car in, that's fine, but you're the owner in Nicaragua. When you get into Costa Rica, you're still the owner. Your residence may be in Nicaragua, but your current situation with your visas in Costa Rica, like you're fine, there's a process for this, it happens all over the world. Most countries let you bring in cars from somewhere. It may be pretty onerous, but they normally let you do it. It's not really a big problem. When you're talking about this situation where a Nicaraguan business owns the car, you get to the border and you say, I am the representative of this business. I'm allowed to drive this car. And Nicaragua says, cool, yeah, yeah. I, all the paperwork checks out. You are a registered agent to drive a car under this business in Nicaragua. And then you drive into Costa Rica and Costa Rica says, okay, who's the owner of this car? You say, this business. And they say, that's not a business in Costa Rica. That, that party doesn't exist. So there's no registered party of the car. There's no way for them to sue someone. There's no one, no one for them to take the car away from. There's no way to track it down because there's no owner in Costa Rica. Businesses only exist within the country in which they're incorporated. You can have treaties like the US and Canada do where businesses cross the border and exist on both sides. That's actually unique. That's not the norm. And so the business that you have here in Nicaragua doesn't exist in Costa Rica. Costa Rica doesn't, doesn't acknowledge it. They don't have access to records on it. They don't have legal recourse against it. And so if you try to bring that car in, Costa Rica is going to say, now, wait a second, this is an unregistered car or a registered car with no, no owner. There's no one to give you permission to drive the car. 
we have no process for checking anything, we can't verify anything, we have no legal recourse, and while you could argue, but they could figure it out, they're not going to let you bring in a car where they can figure it out. That is not their job. That is your job, right? You're the guest in all these situations. You want to go to a new country, you're asking them to let you in. If you make their lives hard, their answer is just going to be no, right? If you're making it super simple, you're paying your fees and everything's done nice and hunky-dory and they don't have to worry about stuff, they're generally going to be like, cool, come and visit our country. But once you're doing something like that, if they were to be like, okay, we'll work around it, that could cost them so much money. Either they have to charge you some ridiculous amount, thousands of dollars to bring in your car, or they would have to just lose money because you'll never spend that much and help their economy that much as a tourist. So it doesn't work out. So this is why countries don't do that. It just doesn't make sense, even though it feels like it should be really easy, right? It's like the, co the company exists in Nicaragua. It's right there. These are separate countries. They have different computer systems. They don't share information. They are not partners in these things. They try to maintain a secure border, but they're not like partner countries that are doing all this stuff together and trying to enable cross-border business exchange. They're just not doing that, right? It's not their job to do that. It shouldn't be an expectation. But because of that, these borders, because we think of them sometimes like states, well, I can just go from New York to Pennsylvania with my car, even if my business owns it. Normally, not always. That's actually not always the case. Um, it feels like, well, these things must be the same. They're not states. These are full independent countries. And so it's like going from the U.S. into Mexico. Yeah, sometimes they'll let you take your car in. They have a lot of processes around that, a lot of paperwork, and a lot of limitations. If you just drive into Mexico, you're limited to like within 10 miles of the border. Maybe it's 100. I don't know. It's not very far, though, and people don't realize it, but most people don't drive that far into Mexico. So most people are like, yeah, you can just drive in. Yeah, you actually can't, right? Not really. And vice versa, same thing. You can't just drive into the U.S. It's complicated. And so that's what's going on here. Nicaragua only has two borders. Neither of those borders have any specific treaty. So if you want to take your car there as a business, that's just not something you can do because of the other countries, not because of Nicaragua. So Nicaragua does allow you through either owning a car and not registering it as a tourist or owning a business as a tourist and that business owns a car allows you to have a car. They're really, really going out of their way to give you car options. This is not Nicaragua locking you down and taking away options. They're actually going above and beyond to give you as much flexibility as they can reasonably do when you're not yet a resident. So the next step is what happens when you do get residency. This is full residency through Migración, not the automatic residency as declared by the tax office. That residency for all intents and purposes means Nothing, but it is a legal status that just in case you ever need it, at 181 days in the country, you do get that. But that doesn't count for anything. Once you get permanent residency, that, so what you get from the tax office is just a declaration. And there's no paperwork. No one tells you. You just have to know the law. At 181 days in the country, you become resident. But it's temporary residency, and no one cares about it, and it gives you absolutely nothing. Like, there's no reason to care. But when you get permanent residency, this is retirement residency, this is marriage residency, this is investor residency, any of the things that we refer to as residency, all the things that we talk about actually applying for and getting, this is when things actually change, and this is why some people do want to have this. This is the one area, cars, where it really starts to make sense. I know. It does change your need to do uh, border runs. If you have a problem getting into Costa Rica or you live really far from a border, which a few of you do, uh, border runs can be a little bit more onerous than if you only have to go to Managua to do a renewal of your cedula. And it's not even a renewal so much as a reprinting. It's a little bit silly, but it's one of the ways that they keep checking up on you under certain circumstances. So we're not gonna go into the details of what, but for basically, for most people, the, the shift from uh, a long-term tourist to a long-term resident with the new residency visa doesn't really affect your day-to-day -to -day too much. Every six months, you got to do a little annoying run. Yes, it's technically simpler under most circumstances, not all, when you're a resident. And it's not, it's not wildly different. Uh, and in some cases, it's more work because if you travel a lot, the tourist one is actually the easier under normal circumstances. And if you live in the south, really close to the Costa Rican border, then normally it is easier to be a tourist. But overall, it's very much uh, uh, six, six and one half dozen of the other. However, the one thing that's really specifically different for most people is that the ability to buy and register a car in your own name becomes an option. And so this is the same as everywhere in the world. Basically, every country, once you have residency official through their immigration department, they allow you to buy and register a car in their country. There's exceptions, but almost everyone does this. 
So this is, again, Nicaragua is just following the global standard in this. It just seems weird because their tourist visa is so powerful and so flexible and covers so many bases that it feels like that is your residency, but technically it's not. So once you're able to register a car in your own name, then obviously, or maybe not obviously, but this should be given what we just talked about, you are now able to drive it over borders. And when you drive it over the border, you, the owner of the car, and the registration of the car travel with you because you still exist on both sides of the border, so the car's owner exists on both sides of the border. Now, of course, every country has its own laws about how you can bring in his car when you're a tourist in their country, and what you need, and what paperwork you need, and how long it can stay, and all that, so there's no guarantee that just because Nicaragua gives you residency, and you're able to own a car, and do own a car in your own name, and register it properly, that Costa Rica or Honduras will allow it in, but under current laws, they do, so they have the right to change that in the future. Of course, it's just important to remember Remember, the, the limitations on the movement of your vehicle are being created by the countries you're moving into, not the country you're leaving. It could, Nicaragua could restrict you from leaving the country with a car, but they don't need to because one, they don't care. It's not their problem if you do something weird and don't have ownership in the, in the other countries, uh, but they also don't need to because the other countries are going to control that for them. So it, this is all just as expected, the same way it works anywhere else. It's just not things we normally think about. We never put all these different contextual pieces together to understand what the mechanisms are doing under the hood. So that's why it's doing what it's doing and why it works that way. And so that is why a lot of people want to get residency because they do want to drive over the borders. A lot of people don't want to drive. A lot of people don't want to drive at all. Then they're like, this residency is really not getting me very much. Um, and some people uh, want to drive, but they just want to drive in the country. And they're like, again, this residency, yeah, it was handy that I can put it in my own name, but I've already dealt with that by that point, right? So, so it's generally not a big deal. Um, but if you're someone like me, who is really looking forward to spending time in Honduras and El Salvador and other places, but those two are so close and easy, it would be great if I could take my own car there, tour around and do lots and lots of videos. And someone just asked me uh, today, won't you, in New World Money, won't you go up and uh, spend some time in El Salvador? He actually asked that I make a new El Salvador channel because he wants me to do so much content. Realistically, I can't do two channels like this. I did, no human can, holy cow. But I do want to spend a lot of time up in El Salvador and being able to drive up there myself with my own car, take my camera equipment, do all that, get some little storage unit up there for a drone because I can have drones everywhere else, just not Nicaragua. Then we can do, add that footage as well and do lots of cool stuff. And that is really on my radar is things I want to do. Once I can drive up there somewhere, probably Honduras, right over the border, I may put um, a drone storage uh, spot. However, I may do it in El Salvador because the whole ferry to La Union thing is so cool that that may be something I use. We'll see. We'll see. I got to play around with a couple things. It would be handy to be right over the border because it is like a two-hour drive from here. Then I could just grab a drone and no matter where I'm heading northbound, I would always have access to that drone. And even if I'm taking a bus up, in theory, someone could meet me and drop it off for me. We'll figure all that out when we get closer to it. That's still several steps away. But when I'm able to get a car in my own name, then things will be easier. So if you're like me, yes, there are benefits but it's pretty isolated, it's pretty niche. Uh, but, so, the big question, why is Nicaragua doing these weird things? They're not. The only thing that they're doing weird is giving you so many options under a tourist visa that it makes everything else feel strange, but it's just acting the way that the rest of the world does and all the little mechanics of all those pieces end up just being things you don't normally deal with under normal life situations. So when they happen to you here, because you're doing unique things for the first time, probably for most of you, first time in your life, and for many of you, the only time in your life, it can seem confusing or non-intuitive or like someone's trying to, you know, limit your options for some reason that doesn't make sense. And that is not at all the case. It is that doing anything else would be odd and complex and very expensive and not very many people would benefit from it. And so the overhead of doing it just doesn't make sense. This is the easiest process. If you come to the country and you just really need a car and you need to be able to drive into other countries and that's a really high priority for you under most circumstances, not all, but most circumstances, you can push residency really quickly and have it in just a couple months. Hire a driver for that little time in between. Do something, be flexible, stay in Managua, just deal with your residency every day. You can move it really quickly if that's something you need, but most people don't. That's definitely the exception, not the rule. I've been here for years. Yeah, I'm gonna get residency. Yes, it's underway. Yes, they're pushing me to get it, but I'm not at a point where like I'm in any hurry all the things I need, except for this one handy thing, 
I already have and have had all along and any encumbrances I've gotten used to over the years. Like it, it's you, you fix the problems, right? You find ways around them and it's all solved for the most part. Yes, it's gonna be handier, I'm looking forward, and it's going to be really good for the show when we start hitting Honduras and El Salvador on a regular basis. And I want to go farther afield. It's just those things are easy drives. Everything else is a, yeah, we're taking a few days to get there kind of drive. However, I did look and even Belize, Belize City specifically, which is on the north side and getting decently close to Mexico, the flight time that I did from there to here is almost identical to the drive time from here to there. And if you include the borders and some bathroom stops, I think they come out to actually identical. It's 20 hours in both cases. So that's a lot of driving, and I don't want to do 20-hour drives anymore. But driving all the way from here to Belize sounds like a really cool road trip. So we'll see. That may, that may happen. Uh, so thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe if you'd like to help support the channel. One, before you go and donate money, which please do, uh, down below, if you could ask more questions, that would be fantastic. And even better, make videos of yourself to send in. All the information on how to record, where to send it, that's all in the description. Please go do that. That is fantastic stuff I love when we can add people into the show. And by the way, uh, Jillian, who sent in the video, we had a long video of her just recently. She and I actually got together and had coffee just the other day. So we've had, finally had a chance to hang out. It's taken us months to be able to, to work that out because I was gone, like all kinds of travel, but uh, we're living close to each other right now. And so that was awesome getting to meet her in person. Thanks, Jillian. But also really awesome that she sent in that video. So that's been really, really cool. And uh, But if you guys would send that in, that would be fantastic. I want to put more of you on the show, get more audience participation, let more people know about you. And if you'd like to support the channel financially, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. Info on the screen, info down below. Always info down below. Everything. Every question. How do I contact you? Down below. How do you, where's the link for, down below. It's in every description of every video. And uh, if you would be so kind as to post on social media, on uh, Facebook, on what used to be Twitter, on Reddit, any of those things, let on a forum you have somewhere, let someone know about the show, that you like it, that it's got a good information, that it explains something they need to know. Tell a friend or family member. Get somebody to keep uh, to sign up and watch the show uh, that does a lot to make this show possible I will see all of you tomorrow and I've been getting better at this four videos are gonna pop up on the screen just click on one it would do a lot of good for the show and let the algorithm know that you like it